Hey folks, I'm Arlian and welcome back to another Crit Hit Reviews. On this week's episode, I'll be addressing Cellar Door Games' most recent title, Full Metal Furies, an isometric, air quote, true co-op, end air quote, brawler with RPG elements, which also carries some well-hidden and altogether optional puzzle elements. But is Full Metal Furies a brilliant alchemy of gameplay types, or is it simply a rogue title in Cellar Door Games' legacy? Well, considering that they so often make or break games, especially things as fast-paced as brawlers, I'm going to address the controls, and I have to say I'm pretty pleased. Not only is there support for both mouse and keyboard users, as well as controllers, they're also fully customizable. With all that said, however, I will agree with the game's controller recommended spiel, since it felt more natural and aiming was solid even without the help of the mouse. Moreover, for those users who are enthusiasts of couch co-op on PC, you can use a combination of keyboard and mouse alongside a controller to delve in the game with a friend which is really helpful, as while well as there is online co-op in Full Metal Furies, it's invitation only, which may sorely limit those individuals who don't have friends who own it, and who aren't feeling adventurous enough to dive into Cellar Door Games' Discord server to seek out folks to play the game with. Admittedly, this did impact me as well, and so the vast majority of my time spent in the game was in offline mode specifically playing solo since Lovey was too busy having her soul consumed by a combination of Black Desert Online and Love Nikki. Still, still, I managed to get enough of a taste of both its online and offline modes to get a feel for what Full Metal Furies is, and to be able to dive into just what true co-op means in context, so... Let's get to it. As I mentioned earlier, Furies is a brawler, specifically stage-oriented with the bulk of its missions sending the players traipsing into enemy territory to wreak bodily harm to legions of enemies and cause a fair bit of collateral damage to unwitting boxes and chests to boot, to culminate into either an arena-esque enemy rush at the end, a boss battle, or some combination of the two. That's not to say that there isn't variety in its stages, given that a number of the levels have some fairly unique twists within them, whether it's some clever puzzles and secrets, or something more akin to a timed survival arena, character challenges, or obstacle courses. There's the boss stages too, and though they are relatively few in number, I found them fun and appealing challenges, and an altogether dramatic change of pace compared to the rest, with special mentions for both the outright intimidating homage to Rogue Legacy, I am looking at you Karen, and the air quote normal and air quote last boss of the game. The game also manages to present itself in a fairly open-ended manner, as despite the fact that the central missions unlock in a linear fashion, there's a veritable plethora of optional stages, some of which are extremely well hidden. And all of those stages, optional and otherwise, are replayable, which is beneficial not just for homicidal gold farming reasons, but also because of the various secrets hidden throughout the game. So where does the true co-op come into play in all this? Well, to be fair, that's actually tied to a handful of gameplay elements, so let's start listing them off. First off, there's the barrier system, which causes some enemies to either start with, develop, or cycle through color-coded shields, which essentially prevent all damage unless they're attacked by the fury who matches the color of the shield. Sure, other players' characters can knock them around to interrupt their attacks, but it means that teamwork becomes necessary to actually defeat enemies, and that combat situations can become quite tricky if a friend drops when a boss or a flock of enemies has a barrier with their color, since you'll need to scramble over to their position and revive their butt to avoid getting overwhelmed. A task which is made marginally easier by the fact that progress towards reviving a friend does slowly tick up on its own. Now, the barrier system isn't unique to the game's co-op, given that whilst a player can only pick one of the Furies to rampage as during co-op, they're given control over a pair in single player that they can actively swap between, which means the barrier system is still alive and well. Rather, the barrier system synergizes with Fury's dynamic difficulty, which changes a few key factors about the game's various encounters, namely the number of enemies that appear in total that can be rampaging at any given time on the screen, and the actual enemy types that end up appearing in those engagements. Suffice to say, if you're in a larger group, the game will throw more challenging formations at you. And honestly, it's a better solution than just scaling up enemy health to make them beefy meat shields, and definitely puts pressure on each player to pull their weight. 
especially with the barrier system in play. Which seeks into the final point, and that's the fact that each one of the Furies plays exceptionally differently from each other, fulfilling wholly unique roles within the team and which allow for some altogether fun and synergistic gameplay, especially given that, short of some code shenanigans, each character can only be represented once in a given game session. But let's touch on the whole unique role within the team. Now, a big part of this is just that while all the basic inputs remain the same for each character, each of the Furies represents a certain archetype in battle, which is in turn reflected in their kit. For instance, while the tank and fighter can frantically mash the attack button to melee enemies into paste, the engineer's initial weapon has a medium range attack, which hits one of the enemies in her cone of effect, and is limited by her need to occasionally reload, forcing you to be a lot more tactical in your aggression. And the sniper just outright becomes immobile while aiming with some post-shot delay to boot. Thankfully, that downside there can be somewhat mitigated considering that attack cancelling is alive and well at Full Metal Furies, helping to add a certain smoothness and flow to the combat, as well as making certain special attacks absolutely devastating in an attack change. Speaking of which, that's certainly another element where the distinctiveness of each kit continues to shine. Whether it's for their special attacks, such as bullet time inducing sniper shots, or just spinning like a murderous Beyblade, or the various defensive capabilities of the various classes. Also, admittedly, that's another part where the sniper's basic kit gets the short end of the stick, as her dodge requires her to aim it and doesn't provide any invincibility frames. Unlike the engineer, who has a low cooldown dodge roll that goes through attacks, the fighter, who can counter anything or leap over attacks, and the tank who can just no-sell things by casually blocking. But wait, I said basic kit, and that's an important detail, because scattered throughout Full Metal Fury's various stages are chests, either as hidden treasures or stage clear rewards. While some of these merely contain gold or trophies which unlock certain features at the base camp, a number of these chests contain the much vaunted weapon blueprints, which allow players to craft gear with the gold they've been acquiring by beating up everything that moves and some things that don't. While some games simplify gear into purely statistical upgrades over their peers, the equipment in this game instead serves to change up how your abilities function. Some may increase the defense capacity of an ability, while others may outright negate it and turn it into another means of offense. An offensive ability might gain the ability to harm its user in exchange for immense power and range. Gold also plays a role in the various classes' skill tree systems, which essentially uses gold as experience allowing players to not only improve their base stats, but also providing them passive abilities that further emphasize their role in combat, and just broaden their capacity for mayhem. All in all, there's a lot to actually customize with the characters, so that you can get something that meshes with your personal playstyle, or synergizes with friends. That said, gold isn't the only form of experience in the game, as players can also accumulate mastery points a sort of progression tied to the use of whatever gear their chosen Furies are currently wearing, and which provides an account-wide buff each time those items level to a certain main stat. Whilst the gains they give are relatively minimal on their own, they do add up. Thankfully, for both gold and mastery, death isn't a brick wall to progress, since not only does the game have a fairly robust checkpoint system as you traverse its stages, it's also incredibly forgiving in regards to character growth progression, allowing you to keep the entirety of gold and mastery experience you accrued, whether or not you live or die. Honestly, the biggest potential brick wall the players might encounter is the Rosetta Stones and the Gates. See, the Rosetta Stones are monoliths which can be found squirreled away in the various stages, the likes of which provide players a clue as to where their other half can be located. While some of these riddles can be fairly straightforward, others are far more opaque. Which is to say that they can be right bastards and they're needed to acquire the passwords to unlock the eponymous gates. What's more, this then leads to the second gates, barriers which generally have some of the trickiest riddles in the games associated with them. These occasionally mind-bending puzzles effectively serve as the barrier which may prevent many casual gamers from accessing Full Metal Fury's true ending, if they don't just end up relying on an online guide. Which is a shame, given that there's a wealth of lore, a true final boss, and the side endings associated with that route, as well as the ability to access New Game Plus. 
Which, yes, that's right, if you can't get enough of the game, there is a new game plus. Not only does it provide players with higher level variants of the stages that were initially available, they also change around the actual battles themselves, both in the enemy setups and altogether aggression of the game's various foes, providing players with a relatively fresh and challenging experience, and one that can feel especially rewarding given the players are also provided with reduced cooldowns, increased gains to their mastery levels, and gold gain essentially allowing them to reach new heights. That said, the challenge does cap with the initial jump of difficulty in New Game Plus, with no further iterations available once you clear that. Now, when it comes to the basic premise of the story... <clears throat> the world is in ruins. Humanity has been engaged in a monumental war for so long that people can't even remember when it started. At the helm of each fighting faction is one of the Titans, creatures of phenomenal power who, due to an inability to decide how humanity should be run, have decided to resolve it over a real-time game of Risk in involving the world. Q, the Furies, an all-female fighting force raised in this dismal world and who are on a mission to save it by beating the Tarot of the Titans and everyone else in their path. You get to find out all these details in generally brief and entirely skippable chunks of dialogue that are scattered throughout the game. If you want to understand the story and figure out the puzzles, it's quite recommended to pay attention. But even beyond that, I actually found them wonderfully cheeky. The story never takes itself all that seriously, though I never found it detracted from it, as I found the game managed to do a good job of flushing out the main characters, the titans, and the other reoccurring characters. <coughs> Not Bob. <coughs> Humor-wise, it's also got a lot going for it, with the game providing a fair amount of meme-worthy moments, a lot of meta-humor, and an absolutely punishing amount of wordplay. Lastly, if you crave plot twists and narrative complications, there's a decent couple later on in the game, though if you're savvy and pay attention to the foreshadowing, you might be able to take a guess at both of them just a bit before they're unveiled. Now when it comes to Full Metal Fury's art direction, there's just a lot of good to be said. Whether it's altogether excellent character portraits and the way they bring a bit more life to the characters, or simply emphasize a particular punchline as the story progresses, a lot of love and care has been put into them and it shows. This attention to detail isn't just limited to dialogue art, however, as the stages are visually pleasing to venture across, though it's the absolutely phenomenal sprite work that had me floored. Everything looked and felt really smooth, and there's a lot of heart and effort put into the game's animation, with some absolutely lovely details put into the weight and feel of combat, but also small details like the idle animations for player characters and NPCs alike. Honestly, the closest I can come to nitpicking is the fact that the time-honored tradition of recolored enemies does occur in Full Metal Furies, but it never really got to me. Oh, and the Desert Temple which provides a unique take on the trials provided by a baking hot desert and managed to give me motion sickness as I navigated the level's heat waves. <laughs> Whilst a funny enough sequence, I was pretty thankful when it finally ended. In the music and sound department, I just don't have any complaints. There's a whole lot of infectious tunes scattered throughout Full Metal Furies, some recurring and others not so much. Thematically, you can expect a lot more upbeat tunes, though there are a couple that manage to instill a bit of awe when you hear them play. What's more, you eventually get the ability to fix the radio at your base camp so that you can listen to your favorite tunes at your leisure and without needing to redo levels and dodge bullets while you're trying to chill. So, when it comes down to my final verdict for Full Metal Furies, I highly enjoy and fully recommend this game. I found it manages to provide a very well-polished brawler, and both the systems that were in place for character growth and progression were enjoyable and didn't feel particularly grindy. With its solid and altogether fun writing, a soundtrack that meshes well with the tone of the game, and just some great graphics, I'd be remiss in giving this game anything but a crit hit for its single player. And that's because, whilst it is co-op, it ended up feeling a bit limited due to being invitation only, and it's an honest shame considering that the online experience is great, 
but if you lack friends to enjoy it with, that particular facet of the game isn't easily accessible. I mean, I'd still recommend the game by sheer merit of blazing through it on your own, but its limitations to co-op ultimately relegated most of my experiences to solo, and so I feel it's a bit of a fumble when it comes to its multiplayer, and fairly hard at that. So, I inwardly pray that it does get changed in a future patch. Anyways, as ever, thanks for watching to the end of this video. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Always good to know what we got right and what needs improving. And if you enjoyed this, like, subscribe, and share this with people you think might be interested. Oh, and if you think you'd enjoy a community devoted to indie gaming and devs, click the link to our Discord server to meet other gamers.